Great, now everyone is here. Okay, so I'm giving this presentation based on a uh, bulk unwinding utility I'm developing for ELF utils. Um, the utility itself is fairly simple. It takes a stream of stack samples, probably originating from perf tool, um, unwinds them, and then gives them back to a profiling tool as call chains. Uh, to explain why I'm doing this project, I also need to review as neutrally as I can the story behind uh, why some commonly used Linux distributions recently disabled frame pointer optimizations. So I'll need to go into uh, a few limitations of why uh, putting back frame pointers into code is not a be all and all solution to get profiling to work and uh, why we might want to return the option of uh, compiling a code with FMIT frame pointer. Okay, so the outline of the talk, I'll give the history of FMIT frame pointer and profiling, uh, give the design of my tool, and um, a initial evaluation of uh, how well the prototype version of it works. Okay, so... Uh, to start with, I assume most people in the audience know how frame pointers work for completeness. This is the oversimplified diagram. Uh, if you compile your code with frame pointers on x86, those are in RBP register, and those are put into the call frame in a way that forms a back chain that you can use to follow your stack uh, all the way down to the root. Um, it was noticed a very long time ago that we don't actually need to do it. This because uh, when we're compiling, we definitely know how large the stack frames are going to be, so we can emit the correct code to uh, clean up the stack frame and return to the parent function. And if we're doing any form of analysis after the fact, we can also have call frame information uh, that again lets us know how the call frame is laid out where to find the next one, and so forth. So, um, developing commonly available call from information was a long time ago a prerequisite for uh, enabling uh, this optimization on a large scale, uh, freeing up an additional register for uh, general purpose computation. Um, as call from information in Dwarf was developed, um, in Dwarf, uh, a debug frame section by code specifies uh, where to actually, what the frame pointer value would be if it, were, if it existed uh, for each instruction in the code. Um, and the frame section was a, a size optimized version of this format meant for uh, inclusion into executables by default. Uh, it's essentially required on Linux executables. Uh, language runtimes use it to support exception handling because, again, you have to unwind the stack to uh, reach a function that contains an exception handler. Uh, one thing to note, there's a URL at the bottom. All of these things are links uh, that you can follow up um, for some of the background behind this. Um, Let's see. So I, I, did, I did a bit of a dive into uh, the history of when GCC uh, enabled this. I didn't actually find when uh, FOMID frame pointer was added to the uh, compiler, the actual optimization itself. That's ancient history. Around 1993, there's a change log entry that uh, foresees the fact that certain optimizations will want that Optimate, certain architectures will want that optimization enabled globally. Um, 2004, there was serious discussion to enable it as a compiler default for x86. Uh, at the time, I believe Java exception unwinding was still a uh, work in progress. So uh, the actual announcement of it being enabled by default uh, is in GCC 4.6 in 2011. Uh, in 2023, there was a request to disable this default. Uh, it was 
not granted because it's a performance loss. So uh, other architectures, um, this is starting to get in, a bit into the weeds because what frame folder means exactly differs architecture by architecture. Uh, but PowerPC doesn't really require the frame pointer for backtracing the way the stack frame bars are laid out. Uh, ARM ABI requires frame pointers except in leaf functions. So there's an omit leaf frame pointer option that GCC on ARM uses by default. Uh, and we can also consider LLVM world generally mirrors, uh, mirrored what GCC did uh, except on recent Apple ARM, where they do weird, they have a weird other unwinding format for CFI. Let's see. So the problem as history unfolded was that these optimizations were enabled based on the uh, A-frame CFI becoming ubiquitous and all of the use cases at the time uh, making good use of it. So that's uh, debugging, which means GDB, and uh, runtime exception handling. We're both perfectly capable of using this information. Uh, use cases for stack unwinding kind of expanded from that uh, to uh, large-scale profiling. And large-scale profiling on Linux typically involved the performance framework, which is in the Linux kernel, and the Linux kernel doesn't really do dwarf. Um, so in the end, uh, a lot of people were uh, had developed basic profiling tools based on perf events and the default unwinding method there, which uh, in user space just uses frame pointers if there are any. Um, the two major people, major kind of use cases affected by this were desktop uh, developers doing uh, profiling interactions between system components. Uh, by desktop, I mean loosely not so much even graphical user interface as uh, also the lower level uh, plumbing behind it. And then other major source of uh, advocacy for disabling frame pointer optimizations were hyperscale enterprises, which uh, have somewhat of a different cost structure in terms of uh, where they're losing performance and uh, what they're willing to pay for in terms of profiling overhead. Um, so I've linked on this slide to various examples of uh, blog posts advocating this. Um, Okay, so since GCC wasn't interested in disabling a FAMID frame pointer, uh, most of the advocacy was targeted at changing the default on the distribution level. Uh, the most well-documented um, discussions are on the, are for Fedora. Uh, so in Fedora 38 on x86-64, uh, if no omit frame pointer was enabled by default, uh, there's a change request, there's a initial FESCO issue that was denied, there was a second one, it was reopened and voted through, there are rancorous mailing list discussions, there's an LWN article covering it. Uh, the really interesting thing to read is actually the pull requests because uh, there they went to disable frame pointer optimizations globally across all the different architectures. Uh, and so, uh, in the process, discovered that PowerPC does something else, uh, S390 does something else, and um, yeah, yep. I think it. Uh, it's important to mention that the Fedora change only is a textual change to the build configuration. Yes. There is no concerted effort to get rid of uh, or to reinstate um, frame pointers in Lee functions that are written in assembly or something like that. So we are using still the current 
GLBC string function implementations that don't have frame pointers. So a certain number of your frames won't have uh, frame pointers anyway, because it's just a textual change to the build configuration. Yeah, exactly. This is just a question of changing the compiler option uh, and anything that results from that and uh, certain packages. Uh, I believe until recently Python had to uh, opt out of it because in order for Python to work well with um, frame pointers, they need to do additional performance work. Uh, Let's see, other distributions where frame pointers were um, returned to package builds by default, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu development discussions are not as Googleable. So I have just the link to the blog post where they announced the change. Um, Arch Linux uh, also turned frame pointers back on. Uh, Debian, there's a request in the bug tracker. There doesn't seem to be as much of an appetite. Uh, anyways, but the um, discussions over this, I feel kind of glossed over a lot of the limitations and nuances of the issue because uh, for the people pushing for this, uh, there really wasn't much incentive to present the story as anything other than um, we will turn frame pointers back on and profiling will work, um, which isn't is almost true, but there's a lot of details. Okay, so I've tried to summarize the basic arguments as they happened on the distribution mailing lists on this slide. Uh, basically, it's rank for us because this is at bottom a win-lose trade-off. Uh, the performance reduction, the consensus if you read discussions is that there's a one or two percent performance loss, but like there's problematic cases where you might lose a lot more, but you can work on fixing those. Uh, the deeper problem is that there's actually a lot of feature requests where you get something potentially nice for a 1 to 2% global performance reduction. Uh, some of these come from the security world. Uh, this one is coming from the uh, profiling world. Uh, if you slow your system down 1% 10 times, that's getting close to 10% performance loss. Um, rule of thumb is that one or two percent of performance gain is one or two years of focused work on improving the optimizations. Uh, we're not in the era of low-hanging fruit improvements. Um, what was promised uh, in the distribution discussions was that you would kind of get that performance disadvantage back because the ability to do profiling on the system would get you profiling driven fixes to various performance issues that are currently lurking on the system. That's really where you get into the win-lose aspect of this because a lot of the uh, profiling for desktop and for uh, data center systems that um, the advocates were interested in doing uh, were about finding kind of uh, badly tuned portions of complex uh, systems of many components. So that's one category of users. There's a different category of users who are more dependent on uh, how thoroughly of a good job the compiler does on optimizations. Are the optimization moving in the correct direction year over year? Uh, and if you have a discussion, we have to decide that one group of users is more important than another group of users. That's never ideal, never good, doesn't lead to fun discussions. <laughs> That's putting it very mildly. <laughs> yeah, especially, especially when you start to trade off with, on one side you have large, hyperscale companies. On the other side, you have, I don't know, 
Yeah. <laughs> People who don't have piles of money and engineers to throw at their particular problems. Anyways, um, there are also problems with profile. Yep. Yep. One aspect I have not seen discussed of that trade-off is comparing adding frame pointers to an application with adding frame pointers to something like the GNU C library. The, gain, the, the benefit versus cost is different, I think, because if you add it to the GNU C library, then you can link what is happening at the kernel level with what is actually issuing the GNU libc call from the application. So even without having deep knowledge into internals of the application where it was at, at least you can link the application code with the effect on the kernel level only by having frame pointers in the libraries. So uh, what I wonder is, has there been some benchmarking done to see this one, two person degradation isn't mainly when enabling frame pointer in the application code or is it mainly when enabling it in the library code? Put you a question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the performance degradation in recent times that, that has been quoted has been like random benchmarks all over the place. Uh, so Python benchmarks and you know uh, sundry benchmarks. Uh, my memory from previous years is that the slowdown of one to two percent was in spec. So that's that's application code. It's not just yeah. libraries, and we right? Did not care about it that much to have the frame pointer in there. Um, sorry, could you say that again? If you're looking mm -hmm. at global system problems, you have much mm -hmm. more value instrumenting the libc and other libraries than instrumenting the spec application. Um, so the the problem with uh, discounting spec in this case is that uh, the spec kind of becomes representative of what the compiler can do in terms of peak performance, right? In, in terms of... Uh, so that's, that's, that's the debate, right? So when, when you look at... Uh, so it's not really a hyperscalers versus the common person kind of dichotomy, right? It's hyperscalers who can probably afford the 1% to 2% uh, uh, performance hit in individual applications because the overall system... They, they, they see opportunity in during the overall system versus uh, other application vendors and other systems integrators for, the, for whom individual application performance is uh, more important than whole system performance. Does that make sense? No. So it's not, it, it's not really one against... Is the spec test case using no Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Has there been a benchmark I can spec Without frame pointer? I, I would. Are you using a list with frame pointer? There has not, but I can tell you, because I, I live in spec every day, less than 1% of the spec runtime is spent in GPC. Less than 1%. You know, two benchmarks uh, that the other one that touches, touches Lipsy the, significant the significant point in there are those that hit yeah. Malakin, which is out. But everybody uses J.E. Malakin, that space. Um, the other one that hits GLC hard is. Um, GCC input five, which is meant second. Yeah, I, I just want to say that we, you're doing it wrong if you're in the core libraries because then you're not running your application, which is the thing you care about that's doing the work that you want it to do. And while, yeah, you may run some libc functions, but in truth, we really expect you not to be in the libraries that often. The thing about spec is it is representative of real world. Workloads. Couldn't you just uh, statically link spec? No, um, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, instead of switching the default for the compiler, you could uh, just set an environment variable while you're doing your builds for the distribution. So, what you want to be. Yeah, that's what we need There's There's no support for the so it's going to be part of the 
as long as we're discussing this arguably irrelevant frame point is in in glibsy thing what we really you really care about for system wide profilers is that point in glibsy in which inline syscall is invoked when it, when it hits the kernel so if you were absolutely mad you could add frame pointers to only those paths in glibsy which culminate in a syscall um, which would mean that things like memset which basically never use syscalls wouldn't be impacted at all but you don't probably don't care about memset because memset is entered once and then pounds the cache and then leaves so it's well, entirely dependent on cache hammering. Um, still, if you were over-optimizing madly, you could do that. I still think this is crazy. But <laughs> um, also, uh, if and when, actually, S-frames gets enabled, this is all becomes moot, which is on the way. So we are actually, I'm one of the kernel developers that's actually implementing it. So it would be able to profile everything. What's that? And then, you'd have, and then you have to go around and turn frame pointers off in all the discrews again. Right. So, then you have to go and turn frame pointers off in all the discrews again. That's good. Yeah, you wouldn't need frame pointers at all. I, I think the main requisite there is that uh, as soon as you can ask perf uh, for a call change, then it'll use S frames behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's the goal with uh, S frames. Okay. Um, so to cover, uh, I think a few a few of the issues I was going to cover got anticipated in the discussion. Uh, that that makes my job easier. Uh, let's see. The function prologues and epilogues, and whether the uh, call frame information you have covers that, and whether they work with frame pointers is an important issue. Uh, the answer is they certainly don't work with uh, frame pointers because that is the point at which the frame pointer register is being updated to uh, match the new function's call frame. Uh, the minimum size for the function prolog is around 8 bytes, 12 bytes on ARCH. Uh, might expand if you put constant initializations there. Uh, this is the minimum size of a prologue. Um, yeah, Will Cohen did some experiments which can be replicated in this one-liner uh, where he took perf, um, limited it to user space, uh, filtered out PLT, which uh, we could include just as well. But this is kind of best case scenario, um, surprisingly, you end up with 5.2% on x86, even more on our architectures, uh, user space samples falling within the first, within the prolog section of the function, presumably. Yeah. So just this is just looking at the first uh, eight bytes uh, into a function. Um, that when that happens, the frame pointer is still affecting the caller stack frame. You lose the uh, current function. Our hypothesis is that this is because the uh, sampler tends to hit freshly loaded functions after a TLB miss. And this also, if you're using the profile data for code layout optimizations, potentially affecting the correctness. Uh, so 5.2% is a best case of how often this happens. Yep. Um, it, by the expression, it looks like you're missing, say, maybe another 5% because you don't count the PLT code. Yeah. So that's another place where you might get into trouble and that percentage will become even greater. Let's see. Anyways, another cause of losing the uh, accuracy of the innermost part of the backtrace is if you have libraries with inline assembly code functions, which glibc is using extensively, uh, those are not coded in a way that imitates what fno emit frame pointer will give you. Um, so it will miss the immediate caller of the inline function. 
uh, I believe is what happens. Um, yeah, and re rewriting those functions either as the new default or as an alternate version is not a realistic ask. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, that mem move to mem copy, is that a... Oh, that's type? a typo. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Because we, we actually have that uh, in, in, in Valgrind sometimes when uh, 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 the iFunks move from uh, uh, mem move to mem copy because they are interchangeable. But oh, okay. No, it would be like the main point is that G is uh, lost. So the frame pointer unwind thinks that we are inside mem copy and the immediate caller it can find is in the previous function f. Okay, so in summary, like, um, can we make profiling work without needing frame pointers everywhere? Surely yes, like the basic assumptions for any project to fix this issue is that FOMID frame point is a performance option. We'd like to preserve the flexibility for people to actually use it. Uh, like in terms of the granularity you can decide it on, you could decide it on compiler and distro level and kind of force it on everyone or on application level. Uh, A-frame data has been widely available for a while. Uh, and well, A-frame data, CFI of some sort and unwinding are necessary to cover the gaps where frame pointer unwinding isn't accurate. So that's prologues, epilogues, and um, library functions that use inline assembly. So um, to see if this works, uh, I built a uh, prototype for uh, an unwinding tool for LFUTILs where the idea is I would take an existing perf-based profiler, try to make a minimal patch to it, keep it as simple as possible. So for that I picked sysprof since uh, that was in the Fedora discussions. Uh, people using sysprof were uh, a major driver of the discussions. So modify that to collect set stack samples, uh, pass them to a new Ophiotils tool called usStackTrace, um, unwind them, and then pass them back to sysprof uh, as if the data had been obtained from uh, a protocol chain. Um, this is just kind of trying to reinvent the wheel as little as possible in terms of design. Uh, we have the existing profile tools uh, we have the existing l 3 unwinder. The goal is just to get data from point A to point B. And we have the existing CFI to work with on the systems already. So I prototyped the idea with sysprof. Uh, this is just the details it uses. Like the existing versions of sysprof gets call chain sample packets, which are um, currently originated from frame pointer and winder. Uh, again, if um, I suppose what's S frame can work with uh, call chains, the question will become uh, can we get S frame data in, in, in addition to A frame ubiquitous on distributions? Um, currently, we have A frame data per sample call chain, doesn't use that. Uh, so instead, we have an, I had an alternate option to uh, get the samples of the register file and stack. Uh, I tune, I bump up the perf ring buffer size and stack sample size. Um, and the, the main point that people who tried to use perf sample stack uh, and evaluate it for uh, profiling missed is that you don't have to use perf record and dump the stack samples to disk. Obviously, that gives you terrible I overhead. So uh, instead, we just 
pass them in memory to the helper program. And that's arguably reasonable overhead. So we this is fairly straightforward. We extend the uh, sysprof file format. Um, basically, sysprof has its own format because its implementation predates using perf. Uh, it used to have its own kernel module. Um, but the format more or less mirrors what uh, perf uh, sample packets look like. So we add sample packets that mirror the perf user stack and uh, register captures. So we, these sample packets are a serial stream. We uh, stream them through uh, a program that basically filters out uh, all of the stack samples and replaces them with uh, unwind packets, and that's EU stack trace. Uh, this is at the bottom how you would invoke it. At the top, uh, again, for simplicity of implementation, for the prototype, we just went with stuffing them into a FIFO. Uh, I know that's not the best possible way, but at that point, I was prioritizing minimal changes to the profiling tool. And this is the most minimal interface uh, on the sysprof side. OK, so in EU stack trace, what types of not completely straightforward things do we have to do? Well, first off, uh, existing Elf tools libraries kind of assume like the master structure for representing information about one process is the DWFL. Uh, obviously, we're looking at all processes on a system. So we end up with a table of these by process ID. Um, for now, we just use Elfutil's existing Linux proc report code, uh, which obtains the information from procfs. So here there is more work needed to uh, make sure this uh, table accurately reflects the state of the system. Uh, there are some uh, edge cases that I need to handle. Yep. Uh, we've run into most of these problems in Dtrace. And while we haven't yet figured out what to do about short-lived processes that die before, in this case, EU stack trees can get hold of them, uh, you, might find thing, uh, you, uh, you might find reuse of PIDs and so on to be solved by... You, could, you, um, you can open memory ranges in prop PID map files directly, uh, and that will, uh, when, when you open that, you get that ELF object out, and it will hang on to it even if the object is deleted. Um, and even, even if the program exits, and it won't, the PID won't be reused until you let go of it. So that problem is quite easy to solve, and it's frankly easier to get hold of a memory range by opening of something in prop PID map files than any, any other route. Yeah, but here, actually, the uh, concern is more about processes that start and uh, stop. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a nasty problem. By the time that we're unwinding the packet, uh, if you find a solution, please let us know. <laughs> yes, so my, it's, it's worth then discussing my current understanding of how to deal with this. Uh, uh, one thing that sysprof added and that actually in the initial prototype I assumed I'd be using more, uh, the proc report turned out to uh, handle the default case for everything else, so is perf m map events. So, uh, in our case, sysprof can collect mmap events. Um, we would accept these, and then we would need to use that information uh, to learn about uh, any processes that are uh, starting up and that uh, proc report uh, Could you might miss for us. Once to impart the profile information if it hasn't done that already. Yeah. Could you clone the process that uh, wants to impart the profile information if it hasn't done that already? So you. Mm, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question 100%. Well, you need um, the uh, um, unread information of the process to. Uh, 
be able to unwind the packet. So, so if you clone the entire process with all its text segment, then you would have what you need there. Probably. The only problem with previous dynamic libraries. Uh, yeah, if we, if we can access the executable uh, object files based on the uh, uh, mapping information, that's we don't need to have the process open at the time we unwind it. The problem is just uh, getting the information about what objects are mapped into the process in time, uh, because that disappears from PROC if the process is So instead of just closed. sending the packet about the profiling, and, uh, and in part the entire process is, is a clone. Yes. Um, these days, you wouldn't need a clone. You just need to take a PIDFD on the process to hand that back in the stream. Hmm. Uh, just if you take, if you t as long as the PIDFD is open, the process won't go away or be recycled. Um, which means you don't need to clone it. The problem is, what if it dies? Even if it dies, it will still hang around as long as the PIDFD is open. Because uh, cloning is very slow, but opening a PIDFD is nearly instantaneous. Yeah. Uh actually considering the whole problem, including the L open and the L close, the, the actual mapping of libraries can change within the lifetime of your process. Mm. And you are processing information after it's been serialized to a ring buffer. So you are doing that as post-processing. So one way we've done in, uh, with LTT and GUST is within the application, we inject an agent, we do user space tracing, we interpose with the DL open and DL close. We basically trace load and unload of every library along with the build ID and everything that is needed to then do a proper backtrace in, at the proper time at any point in the trace. Uh, there, is one, there is one simplification there, which is that in practice, at least on systems using Glibc and Muscle, um, you, could, uh, you will find new libraries appearing when DL open is done, but DL close never closes them again. So you don't actually need to trace library closing. Um, you only really need to trace opening. Um, and as far as I can tell, there is no intention to ever have libraries be unmapped when a close happens because it's just a flaming nightmare, right? No, we have Oh, you do? Oh, no, I'm, 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 I'm out of date, sorry. Ah, I'm out of date, sorry. Yeah, so anyways, uh, it, it's interesting to see that uh, this is a problem other people are also having to deal with, but yeah. Um, other than that, the unwinding procedure, Elfitol's unwinder, it takes callbacks which have a set initial register function and a memory read function. Um, this was originally developed for ptrace access directly to the process and for core file dumps. But it works perfectly fine if you just have a stack sample uh, you know where it's based in the address space. Uh, and so you just uh, return what the memory re read for the corresponding location in the sample. Uh, um, the, 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 the only really annoying detail in the implementation was the fact that on x86, the um, register files, it passes from hardware to perf to uh, dwarf. This is just historical artifacts, like the way the registers are ordered changes in baffling ways. Uh, like, I've basically sourced which headers need to be looked at to make sense of this. Uh, I think Qt has a perf parser project, which has also had to deal with this, and they have a table of, they have a header of a table of magic numbers, which shows that this can be done, but doesn't explain it very well. This is the actual primary source for what is happening in what order. If I recall, ARM is actually even worse than this. Um, it's, it's, um, certainly Spark is worse. It's got, it's, it's got de several different de ordering definitions which either aren't used or are completely lies. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is also complicated if you um, request a subset of the registers, then they're just compacted into the array, um, shifted over. But 
like the basic order that they appear in. You have to take them, accept them from perf in this order, and then for anything that the user's dwarf, it expects them in this order. Interesting historical artifact, but... Okay, and uh, after we've unwound the stack samples, we have, uh, I guess, following the perf terminology, call chains of instruction pointers, we pass them to sysprof. Uh, sysprof has its own logic for turning instruction pointers into a full backtrace with function names, so we don't have to do that for the profiler. Uh, that runs actually as a second pass after profiling is done. Um, it, it used to actually run when you uh, opened the file to look at the profile, which meant that syscap files didn't have very good longevity in terms of, or portability in terms of uh, needing to have access to the correct executables to make sense of them. That was fixed a while ago, so the end syscap file is a full profile with uh, function symbols annotated. Um, okay, so here's the actually, I think, interesting question is how do we evaluate uh, how well this works, uh, which I think applies to really any proposal to change things around or have a new profiler. Uh, so really, I only really, really have the beginnings of an answer to this. But what I did for EU stack trace, um, I added a few diagnostics to libdwfo frame unwind code uh, to record which method was used. Um, this can potentially even change per frame because we're bouncing around different functions. Uh, the current LFUTILS implementation defaults to a frame. If that's not available, it checks for dwarf debug frame. If that's not available, then uh, it has EBL unwind, which is the basic, whatever the basic frame pointer unwind method, back chain unwind method for the architecture is. Uh, obviously, I can see this in detailed debug output, but um, we probably want to do larger scale analysis. So just gather some statistics. Uh, my rough estimate for unsuccessful unwinds is just count any sample with two or fewer frames in the backtrace as lost. Uh, this might be pessimistic in the unusual situation that you actually get a genuine sample that that's shallow. Um, so for, uh, to be sure, uh, we're, we, we're just applying the same estimate to uh, any methods that we're comparing and really just looking at whatever major differences or outliers there are. Um, you know, if, so I want to jump back and forth between this and the next slide. I've compacted the data down to just this one slide. Uh, the other interesting question is what to test. Uh, so thus far I've looked at desktop stuff primarily. Uh, this at the top stress energy matrix is computation heavy. It's a basic sanity test that shouldn't really have any real uh, overload. So what I'm gathering uh, for the CFI unwind with U stack trace, uh, obviously as sysprof and U stack trace are running, they're doing this on the same system that's being profiled. So they show up in the profile. Uh, we want that load to be fairly small. So uh, in this case, where we have a computational benchmark that's um, just using the entire uh, CPU that doesn't have a huge ton of uh, separate executables to get CFI for. Uh, that is the case. Uh, I'm also tracking how many samples had uh, two or fewer frames in the final data. Uh, so all of this 
looks reasonable. I'm comparing it to the uh, default frame port unwind by just uh, passing uh, sysprof's default mode data through EU stack trace. What this gives me is also the question of was it a smart idea to use a FIFO uh, to stream the data? Uh, this gives us the overhead of just using the FIFO, and we also have the same statistics in the same format. Uh, you stack trace can look at the call chain sample packets and gather that. Um, okay, so uh, this works. I'm a a uh, simple person, I use i3 on my desktop, so uh, there's not that much going on in my system when I profile the benchmark. So I have to set up a system with GNOME and test that. Uh, so I run basic GNOME 3 desktop unloaded for 30 seconds and for five minutes. Uh, here I'm seeing there's more work to be done. Uh, in terms of, so the lost packets here, I have to qualify. Uh, when I look at the actual long running core uh, processes, those are being profiled just fine with sysprof plus EU stack trace plus self util CFI and wind. This is where the short lived processes come in because I found that the default GNOME system is constantly starting and stopping these. PKLA check off process. So, uh, and EU stack trace doesn't get to the proc entry for those in time before it disappears. So, those show up as unknown in the statistics. It doesn't know what the process name is or where the executable is. Um, if we knew, we could unwind after the fact. Okay. And yeah, basically, uh, this is also the case for uh, long running, because in five minutes, this is, this is closer to a completely idle system. Uh, 30 seconds, I would be um, opening and closing other apps and uh, shaking windows around. Uh, LibreOffice, I used an open benchmarking uh, PDF conversion benchmark for that. Uh, this looks closer. I'm still running it on the same GNOME system, so it's still, um, the data is still full of those short-lived uh, processes. Um, but F40 is a version of Fedora that's been compiled with frame pointers. Uh, the basic issue here is that if your program has frame pointers, then the CFI for that is straightforward because Outside of prologue and epilogue, the CFI will tell you to look at the frame pointer. Uh, so I want to see how much, uh, if the system is non-frame pointer, uh, how much additional complication. And yeah, there is additional overhead. Um, so the next question when I go home from Cauldron is, uh, what does it take to fix this? So here is actually where this is a, also going to be an interesting question for the uh, other people working on this with S-Frame and such. The basic problem with something like a desktop system is that processes are being started and stopped all the time. Uh, in the LibreOffice benchmark, this is uh, a substantive issue because it's doing several runs, five to seven of. That won't be a problem with S frame because the, the intent, uh, intended use of S frame is that from the kernel, instead of grabbing like 2K worth of stack and copying that over, the approach will be to walk the stack in as it happens. So even if it, you have a short lived process, mm -hmm. while it runs, while the sample is being taken from mm -hmm. a return to user space after NMI or whatever, then we read the stack using S-frame information and we okay. collect what we need. But the question here is actually different from what we discussed earlier, which is if you start up LibreOffice 10 times to do a PDF conversion benchmark, 
uh, are you retrieving and parsing the CFI that for the object files that many times? S frame is a separate section. Yeah, so for that, for the S frame section then, and how much overhead is that if you're doing it repeatedly? We'll have to benchmark that, but it's being okay. designed to be quite fast to access. But okay. related to that, I have maybe one thing I'll want to discuss with Carlos after is, could we just enable frame pointers for something like libc on every distro? Uh, that would cover a, like 90% of use cases of where profiling is useful to correlate what's happening at kernel level with what in, uh, caused that at the user space level. Yes, but do we keep, so I'm talking really about causality of the effect of using the system badly. So let's say someone calls a system call thinking, oh, it must be fast. So let's call that in a type loop in my program as if it was fast. So you want to know who's using the syscall badly. But this is not about, oh, I have a tight loop consuming most of my CPU time. We're not talking about profiling in that sense. We're talking about finding the bad use of costly system call through causality. And GNU-LEBC is hiding that causality from us. So I can actually don't have note that uh, having a version of libc with frame pointers enabled was what Ubuntu was doing previously. Okay. So if you wanted to do uh, that type of profiling on Ubuntu, uh, before they enabled frame pointers globally, you could install libc uh, prof and package, and that would have, so. Um, if you don't have frame pointers at the, at the basic level when you take your backtrace, even if you have frame pointers in the you see, your backtrace won't be able to reach them. It will reach the application. Yeah, so, that, so there is also an issue of, Different no, no, users no, of see profiling it. tend to care more about the top or the bottom of the stack. So a lot of the push for frame pointers is actually um, from people who care about the bottom of the stack. Uh, they tend to draw flame graphs uh, for profiling for something like PGO, uh, the top of the stack where you can see what the likely code locality issues are. Is probably more important. So uh, anyways, it looks like we've uh, run out of time. So I'll just summarize the um, main things that can be improved about this. First off, uh, yeah, we don't have to repeatedly uh, reload the CFI for the, same for the same process that's starting up repeatedly uh, because that can be uh, to a large extent cached. We know if we loaded the object previously, um, so this requires modifications to the uh, LFUTILS libraries and how DWFL was represented. So I'm actually interested in trying that and see how much I can improve these results. Um, again, if S-Frame comes online such that we can get uh, call chains, again, it would be interesting to uh, compare what we get with all of these numbers. So I have a slide with kind of a laundry list of things that I'm planning to work on next. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's 12.01 lunchtime, so uh, I don't know, how can we summarize this as succinctly as possible? So I took existing LFUTIL CFI unwinder, uh, wrote glue to stream, stack samples to it, and it pretty much worked. Uh, there's interesting details to fix, but uh, I, think, I think the interesting question is why uh, this, this type of thing hasn't been done earlier, uh, because LFUTILS and A-Frame have existed for a long time. It was just a matter of getting the data into it. Uh, so this is Probably interesting work for LVTOL's project, regardless of what happens next with things like S-Frame or Shadow Stacks, simply because um, kind of getting uh, from these numbers to perfect numbers 
uh, is likely to uh, point to improvements, um, not so much even in the of utils CFI and Winder as in as with the interface to access it. So that's my talk. <laughs>